your box full of your clothes and provisions through the school gates at resumption. With pride, you chose your bunk space in the dormitory and hooked up your mosquito net. With pride, you followed your mates to the tap in the morning to fetch water to bath. <laughs> with pride, you pinned your school badge to your shirts and sang the school anthem in the assembly hall. With pride, you identified yourself anywhere you went as a student of a federal government college. But where is that pride today? 30 years ago, it was the aspiration of my parents for me to go to a public school. What is my aspiration for my children today? What is your aspiration for your children today? I'll tell you. You'll send them abroad for their education. And if you cannot afford to do this, you'll send them to a private school. And if you cannot afford to do this, then you'll very reluctantly consider the Nigerian public school. So in 30 years, our public schools have gone from being the first choice for our children to being the last. To me, this is one of the saddest commentaries on the state of governance in our country over the last 30 years. And this trend worries me more than what is happening in the northeast or in the south-south. It worries me more than the state of our roads or the epileptic nature of power supply in this country. And I'll tell you why. Firstly, education, particularly when it is generally accessible, is a bridge builder. For the public school system is often the scene of very many important social firsts. It may be the first time the child of the rich will share a bunk bed with the child of the poor. It may be the first time a Christian will share a desk in class with a, with a Muslim. It may be the first time a boy born and bred in Abba will be best friends with a boy born and bred in Zamfara so that they will jump friends together, cut grass together, wash toilet together. And so 40 odd years later, when this boy from Zamfara, now a man, hears one of his colleagues in the office maybe say, you know how all these Igbo people are, they're all the same. He's able to interject and say, no, I went to Federal Government College in Ubu, and my best friend there was Chinedu. So no, that is not how all Igbo people are. I tell you, the future of a multicultural nation like ours depends on interjections like this in everyday conversations up and down this country. Secondly, education, particularly when it is secular and broad-based, helps to create shared social perspectives. But in this country where it is not possible to choose or change your own tribe, <laughs> Education creates a brand new tribe, one that can be freely chosen by anyone regardless of their background. And what tribe is this? The tribe of those who value knowledge, who respect empirical data, who defer to superior arguments, who are lifelong admirers of reason. For now you know that HIV AIDS cannot be cured by having a bath, and that it is the competence, not the ethnicity of a pilot that flies the plane. Now you know that meningitis is a disease of the body, not of the soul. But that the soul can be diseased with ailments like tribalism and bigotry. It is education that gives you this capability to recognize and respect what is a fact at, in all cases, regardless of the faith or the tribe or the social background of the person that points out that fact to you. Thirdly, education, particularly where it is qualitative and broad-based, it helps to moderate social tensions. This is a tension between the haves and the have-nots. But by giving poor people access to the same quality of education as the rich, you not only give them the capacity to change their socioeconomic circumstance, you give them the capacity to moderate how they express grievance over that socioeconomic circumstance. So in a country that is already deeply divided over faith and tribe, to neglect the education of the generality of our people, <laughs> In a country where peace depends on our ability to carry out very sensitive conversations over potentially explosive issues, to neglect the education of the generality of our people is not just to ask for trouble, it is to guarantee trouble. For in the end, a society cannot rise above the level of the mentality of its majority. So that to predict the future of a society, what you need to examine is not really the content of the speeches of its politicians. What you need to examine is the content of the curriculum for its students. And I say this because I am an idealist. No, this does not mean that I have my head in the clouds. What it means is that I believe firmly that ideas precede reality. So that before something can exist in the physical, material world, it must first exist as an idea in somebody's mind. So, for instance, before there was electricity, there were people who thought about it, then dedicated their lives to going out to invent it, to chasing that dream and following those convictions for its clear thinking, not concrete, that holds up great nations. For the height of a tree is the depth of its roots. 
So a society cannot be much more than the sum of its thoughts. It's what you reason, that's what you conceive. And when life puts pressure, that's what you will give. For this world is advanced not by latest gadgets, but by people who don't accept mental limitations. This is the power of the mind. That is why crude oil cannot compete with an enlightened mind. That is why Agbada and Babariga cannot compete with ideas. That is why Nigeria, with all her natural resources, cannot compete with a little nation with no natural resources worth mentioning called Singapore. This is a large part of why we were colonized in the first place. Not because we were lesser human beings, but because in that struggle between civilizations, the other side had access in many critical areas to more advanced thinking, as evidenced in more sophisticated technology. And this is why that poet, prophet, philosopher by the name of Bob Marley once urged us to emancipate yourselves from mental slavery. None but ourselves can free our minds. Imagine it. In Nigeria, where election campaigns are dominated by debates and not slogans, where you can no longer purchase the votes of that woman by shoving a mudra of rice into her hand, where she will say, no, no, Mr. Politician, keep your rice. Just help me answer one simple question. How do you intend to balance the budget? Imagine in Nigeria where research into the illnesses that afflict us like um, sickle cell or prostate cancer or breast cancer, where research and development into cures to these illnesses happen here. Where other people do not come, harvest our medicinal plants, take them elsewhere, convert them to wonder drugs, then sell them back to us. Imagine a country where it is common knowledge that there is no physical or metaphysical benefit to be gained by slicing off the clitoris of a young girl or limiting her socioeconomic options in society. Imagine in Nigeria where we no longer allow limitations to be placed on the part of anyone on grounds of custom and tradition or faith or religion, where everybody is free to become who and all that they can be in this life. Imagine a country that is powered by the almost limitless energy of our collective and enlightened minds and ask yourself on what part of the struggle to build a society like this are you on? Are you fighting on the side of ignorance and prejudice and bias and blind and unquestioning adherence to culture and tradition? Are you fighting on the side of reason, of the spread of knowledge, of enlightenment for all? With the unprecedented power that the internet has given you to spread your ideas, you as an individual, you as a company, you as an NGO, you as the government, what part of this struggle are you fighting on? Thank you very much.